I want to show you something that God did with me. Boy, oh boy, he really put me through the ringer. But I know when he does this, he's testing my heart. He's making sure that I'm, you know, continue, that I continue to be in a position of serving him and not serving my own interests or afraid of, you know, having to correct myself. But this one was kind of a doozy because I did this, um, I did this series not that long ago on Arab nations and Israel in prophecy. And I went through these different books, Isaiah, Ezekiel in particular, and demonstrated for you well, you know, I talked about the razor of judgment and that being the king of Assyria and that the way that God shaves down Jerusalem into this final smaller remnant is through hardening. If you have a heart for him, obviously you're not going to be hardened, but if you don't, you're shaved off. And I talked about this judgment of God using the king of Assyria to shave down his people and that it is a judgment. And anytime he sends a judgment, what he's doing is testing your heart. Are you going to return to him or not? Because that's your covenant. I mean, that's the covenant that he established with us. I also shared something about uh, something else that he was talking with me about concurrently as he was putting this picture together about him overflowing your hiding place. So he's continued to bring this picture together even beyond me doing that, uh, that series on Arab nations in Israel. And I think that this might also be part of the reason why I had such a really difficult day today. Because anytime that he's revealing something big, the the enemy is seems to be allowed to mess with me. And I know that that's not because God gr- brings grief willingly. It's because he's testing my heart and building me to be able to speak the message with confidence and To not just speak a message that I think this is what he's telling me right now, but to be certain. In order to do that, there is a lot of accusation that comes from the enemy. And I have to keep working myself into, okay, let me go back to scripture. Let me go back and read and read and read. Let me make sure that that option is not true. Let me, you know, so it's really him like molding me and molding me and molding me and tightening Gosh, I don't even know. I don't know how to describe this, but I just feel like maybe a, a screw or a bolt that's being tightened so hard. And I feel like my threads are going to strip, but he knows the breaking point. Like he knows how to take me just before that breaking point. Because as he's told me so many times, he's not going to destroy me. He's not going to break me. He's going to break my flesh, but he's not going to break me. He's not going to break my faith. He's not going to break my spirit. That would be of no use to him especially to break someone who has truly loved him. And I know that I have. God kept speaking the book of Micah to me. He kept, he kept pressing on me to read the book of Micah. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how much I've shared as he's been bringing me through this. I believe that I have shared the book of Micah, Habakkuk, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. These are books that he has brought me back over and over and over and had me reading them over and over and over in order to put this picture together that he's putting together now. You know, you have to have the familiarity with scripture. You have to be a good student of scripture while also not trying to pretend like you know what this is going to look like, what this prophecy is going to look like. Because most of the time, these prophecies, we don't know what this is going to look like. And a lot of the time, these prophecies have already been fulfilled in a particular way, but the way that it was fulfilled is a sign to us in the future, and that is the case with this particular prophecy. So what happens in the book of Isaiah with the king of Assyria coming against Jerus- or coming against uh, Israel, this did happen. It actually happened in Kings and Chronicles. And so today, I mean, when he was revealing this to me and I did that series, it was so clear, it was so clear and then I started to think, wait a minute, is it, is it a message for right now? Is it a sign? I mean, I was so certain of that when I, was, when I was doing it. I was so certain of that by the Spirit, that that's what he was showing me. And then I started to, started to question it. Well, he's had me read the book of Micah over and over today. And I've literally, I mean, I've, I've cried about this a few times throughout the day today because I want to be sure. I want to be sure that what I'm speaking, especially in a series like that, 
or telling you like this is what he's telling me is going to happen, I want to be sure that this is true. And I know I've done my due diligence in terms of reading over and over and over the places that he's brought me to in scripture, but sometimes the message that he builds is really, really intense. And if you notice his pattern in scripture is to tell you a little bit about this particular event in this book and then in that book and then in that book. And, and sometimes you can start to get confused or question, maybe confused isn't really the word, I associate confus- confusion with the devil, but sometimes it can feel like complicated and you just need, you need some witnesses. You need God to give you those witnesses that this is indeed, that he is speaking a message to you for right now. If I can share my personal experience, that's my personal experience of listening to God and what it is that he is uh, telling me for the times. And listen, I don't think that this is just for his prophets because he does say that we are supposed to know the times so that we know what Israel ought to do. We are Israel. So this is everyone's responsibility. That's why I'm sharing that part of this with you. So as I was reading Micah, one of the first things that I noticed is in Micah 1 that it says something similar to what I know in Isaiah 7. It says, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth. During the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Listen, do you see why you have to read scripture over and over and over? And and as many times as God puts specific scripture on you, you got to read it over and over. How in the world would I ever put this together? But he drew my attention to it because I've read Isaiah 7 probably a hundred times in the last month. Listen to what it says. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah... King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. So Micah is seeing the vision at the same time that Isaiah is seeing this vision. And then you have in Isaiah 1, again, you know, I've read the book of Isaiah so many times, so I know the language and it and the Holy Spirit is able to, as long as I have that repertoire, I've done my studying the Holy Spirit is able to say, this is familiar to you. Go look it up. Okay, so Isaiah 1, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Again, there are those kings. And so we know that Micah and Isaiah are seeing the same visions. Two or more witnesses. These are his two witnesses, his prophets. Oh, goodness, I was thinking of Isaiah 2. Okay, Isaiah 2, but... Regardless, we have another witness in Isaiah 1 of the timing of when God is showing this vision. So Isaiah 2 says, this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Okay, we already know that they're seeing this vision at the same time. So it's not like one is citing the other. Now let's go to Micah 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will stream to it. Sound familiar? Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Okay, that sounds weird, right? But all it means, and I think I've talked about this in other videos, is you're not training for war anymore. Your swords are being beaten into plowshares. Plowshares means you're working the land. You're You're not worried about, you know, keeping that piece of metal as a sword, as a weapon. And their spears, weapon, into pruning hooks, working the land. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Okay, so same timing, 
same message being spoken to both of them. So you know that whatever is happening in Isaiah is also, or whatever is being referenced in Isaiah is also being referenced in Micah, and that these things are a sign if indeed there's a clue that this is talking about the end. And in, I don't know which video it was in that series, but I talked about these things being a sign. So even if they've happened and you think, oh, well, they've already been fulfilled. No. Yeah, yes, they've already been fulfilled, but the significance of them is a sign to us today. God has been known to fulfill things over and over, hasn't he? So Passover in Egypt, Passover, Jesus on the cross, Passover at the end of the age when he places the seal of God on our foreheads and our right hands and we are passed over when he brings his great wrath and when he brings his woes that start in the fifth trumpet. So it's not like God can only fulfill something one time. He can use something in order to build our understanding. And this is another reason why if you are a person who thinks that you only need to read the New Testament, you don't need to know the Old Testament, you can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old, and you can't understand the New without, excuse me, the Old without understanding the New. You need all of God, not part of him. Not the convenient parts, not the parts that you just want, like the cherry-picked parts. You need all of him. Now, Micah 5 tells us the times. It says, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. Okay, you, if you know Revelation 12, you should. this should be very, very clear to you. He who, or she who is in labor, not he, uh, bears a son, and we know that that's Jesus, we know that from Revelation 12, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Well, whether you be male or female, you are considered a brother adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ. So we know that Israel, that those descended from Israel, they aren't going to be brought in until the end, actually during this year leading up to the Antichrist rising. So we know that they're not going to be brought in until the end because Paul tells us that. He says the Israelites have been hardened until the full number of Gentiles has been brought in. What is he saying here? Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Now is the time for them to be brought in. And what is God going to use? Well, as we studied Isaiah, we saw that what he's going to use is the razor, the king of Assyria, and that those who don't have a heart for God are going to be shaved off. You're going to know. You're going to see them be hardened. And if you can't see that, it's because you're one of the ones that's been shaved off. So you better return to God to make sure that you don't end up being in that category. So again, Micah 5, therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. We know that that's not going to happen until the end. Paul, Paul made it very clear. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortress. Okay, do you hear that? So now we have in Micah, again, the reference to that king of Assyria. When is that going to happen? It's going to happen at this time when... Israel is coming back in. So what God has been talking to me about, and I cried, I mean, cried and called out to him and, and was like, I was so certain about what you were speaking to me. And now I have these questions. Now I'm being tested, you know, and, and this and that. He has made it so clear by bringing me to this scripture. And I just really wanted to share it with you for his glory, because I can't do that. There's no way that I can do that, nor can I wake myself up and be like, read Micah today. I think that I've read Micah, like no exaggeration, probably seven times today. I'm so grateful that he has made this so abundantly clear about when this is happening and that we've had all of these different witnesses throughout scripture in the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah 
And I've explained it to you in that series. And now again, he's giving me another witness. He's just so faithful to do that. I'm so grateful because I think one of the worst things that I could ever, that I can even imagine is spreading a false message. Like if I spoke something that was not true to you and I didn't have the opportunity to correct it and make sure that you weren't led astray, like that would just, it would hurt me so much. And that's really what I was hurting over today was needing to know. I need to know. I have to know that what I've spoken is the truth and that what you've shown me is the truth. Okay. As in other videos, my little um, dog is snoring. So if you hear her, that's what it is. Okay. So we see exactly when the Assyrian is doing this. So verse five, Micah five, verse five, it says, and he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. Okay, this is what he's bringing to test hearts. Listen, again, I want to repeat this because I said it earlier and I want to make sure that you heard it. When God brings judgment, what he's doing is stirring you up in order to remind you to return to him. And at this point in history, people are not returning to him. So he's going to have to bring something pretty bad. So this judgment of the king of Assyria to shave you, it's going to be bad. And he even says in Isaiah, uh, my people don't be afraid of the Assyrian who beats you with a rod as Egypt did. So it's not going to be good. Uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I have been telling you this for the entire time that I've been on this channel, I've been directing you toward the judgments that he's bringing. He has brought judgments, absolutely has brought judgments as I've been talking about it. Um, but I spoke about, I spoke about um, economic collapse, war, um, plague. I spoke about that two and a half years ago and no one heeded the message because you know how I know? Because you guys don't come to Sabbath. You don't come to New Moon. You don't ask me questions about how to do the work in the books. So, I mean, I know. I know the fruit of someone who actually does their work and is in their covenant because I'm in it. And there are some who do come to Sabbath and they ask questions and they do this work and they bear the fruit. A thousand sixty something of you are not, but you're going to need to do it now or you're going to be shaved off. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The message is true. With God giving me this confirmation, I know, I know that I know that I know that this message is true. I know, I remember when I did that series, I remember what I was feeling in the spirit. And again, he revealed more to me and I posted in another video, not, not entitled under that series, but I posted another video and he's continued up to today and probably will continue to testify and confirm that the message is true. My job, obviously, is to stay, make sure that I'm in step with him, that I'm hearing from him, that this is not a message for myself, that this isn't something I want, um, and that's the reason I'm speaking it, because there are some things about this that I do want to happen. So I have to test myself and test myself and test myself and make sure that I'm getting that affirmation from God that this is, in fact, true. So for that reason, that's why I believe that I was tested a lot today. Okay, the other part that he drew me to is in Micah 4.10. Because the king of Assyria, as we learn in, in the book of Jeremiah, the, the, the shaving or the sword, famine, wild beast, and plague, which the king of Assyria represents the wild beast part. In the book of Jeremiah, we learn that that is sent in order, it's sent before Babylon lays siege to Jerusalem. And the reason why is because God was weakening the Israelites in order for it to be easy for, for Nebuchadnezzar to uh, capture them. He states it in the book of Jeremiah. I went over it in, uh, in one of the videos in this series. Now, if he did that previously, that's a sign to you that he's going to do it again, especially because he's using the same language. He's referring to the Antichrist kingdom as Babylon or Babylon the Great and the prostitutes that were out of her and the image that Babylon is worshiping. The image of the Antichrist that's going to kill God's people. All of that is the, is the Antichrist kingdom, including the false prophet. So Christian nationalism, Christian Zionism, Jewish Zionism, all of that is included. All of that counterfeit religion. 
once the king of Assyria does what, or once God does through the king of Assyria, the club that's in his hand, as he describes in in, uh, the book of Isaiah, he says the club of my wrath. Once he has shaved Jerusalem, then the Antichrist is going to rise. When the Antichrist rises, that is Babylon. So that's what we're talking about here in Micah chapter four. So Micah is talking about not only Assyria, but also Babylon. And so in Micah 4, 10, it says, writhe in agony, daughter Zion, like a woman in labor. For you must na- you, for now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon and there you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hands of your enemies. So not in Assyria, but in Babylon. So the king of Assyria comes first, then Babylon. Let me tell you what that's representing. The king of Assyria is shaving off all those who have not loved truth, shaving them down into a remnant, and that remnant returns before Babylon lays siege to Jerusalem. How do I know that? Because it says so in Revelation 9. It says that now the woes have started because they've killed God's prophets and the Antichrist is risen to overpower and kill the witnesses, and then he goes off to to pursue God's church in that Antichrist reign. And God begins the woes. So he sends a plague on all those who do not have the seal of God. It's already been decided. Like there's been a separation there. So no one else is going to come back in. And later on in the chapter, it says of those who did not die of these plagues, they did not repent. No one returns to God after this. So this decision has been made before the Antichrist rises. Now, why does that matter? And why does God continue to have people here? Because now you're being now you're going to be tested. The king of Assyria was to was indeed to test you and to shave down Jerusalem into a remnant, but it was to get you in. Now you're going to have to live through some testing and live out that covenant. Everyone's got the same covenant, guys. I know that, you know, people like to take the example of the guy who was who was on the cross next, next to Jesus and you know and and Jesus said you'll be in paradise with me. Uh you know, I think he said this very night. I, I've cited this so many times. This interview that was done with uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter, who claims to be a Christian, and has told, apparently, uh, per his report, has told all his staff that if he's on his deathbed to remind him to repent, like, how, how, do you, how will you not remember? And also, how do you think it's that easy? Like, like when you can just live this, like, self-indulgent life never serving God's house, not manage your own house, not repent, not return to him. And then like, you're going to do it at the last minute. That's so wicked. And I think that what he thought when he was saying it is that this was a a, a righteous story to share. Yeah, I don't think so. That isn't God's heart. I know what, what, you know, I, I have some familiarity with God's heart because he's brought me through the ringer. And because I know his word, you need to heal as an individual. You need to walk in the, in the trust that he has given you. And then you need to serve in his house because if you are not walking in the trust that he's given you here, why would you think that he would give you more trust? You're going to be priests of God and reign with him for a thousand years. If you're not doing it here, you're not going to do it in the next age. And I'm not talking about a priest in some counterfeit church or denomination. I'm talking about the real meaning of priest, which means one set apart and dedicated to God, serving in his house, serving as the eye, the leg, the toe, the foot. I don't care what it is. You have to be serving in the part of the body for which God has set you apart to fill. He set you apart for the purpose. If you don't live in that purpose, you're not his. So I just wanted to share with you this, the, these witnesses, this proof that the message that God has spoken to me is true. It is consistent. He has sent more witnesses in order to, um, to show that to me. And I just want to give him give him glory for that and, and share with you what he's showing me. Please go discern this message with God and please don't just listen to the things I say, put them into practice. If you discern them to be true, God tells you that this is true. Put these things into practice.